Hello, thank you so much for joining me on the same drugs. I'm really looking forward to talking with you yet again. Thank you so much. It's been a while since we've talked last, but I always really enjoy talking with you. Um, Likewise. Really appreciate all the, the work that you do. Um, I mean, so start by telling me, you've, you've written a book called Trans about transgenderism, which what we now call transgenderism in any case, which was once referred to as transsexualism and things like that. But what was it that first, you know, got you engaged in this issue of gender identity and trans activism and transitioning? So doing journalism, basically. Uh, somebody asked me to look into something that puzzled them at work, namely why kids had started saying that they were transgender or were non-binary or whatever, and uh, to just just start poking around, really. And I wrote about it. I wrote an article that, if I look back, I think it stands up like 80% now in about 2017, I think that was. But even at the time, I knew I wasn't happy with what I was writing and what I was seeing. You know, it was more... I, I was taking the narrative that I was being told, like I accepted that there are some people who, in some way that I hadn't managed to work out what that could mean, that I hadn't interrogated it, some people who were really meant to be members of the opposite sex inside somehow. Like, you know, without saying it out loud, I thought that there were people who were boys and girls' bodies or girls and boys' bodies, and I wrote the article from there, but I, I mean, I saw that there were big problems with it. Uh, that there were obviously people who were confused kids who were getting caught up in this, or that it would be a problem for women's rights, in particular women's single sex spaces. And then it just mulled around really for about a year. Uh, and then in the summer of 2018, I really did what we all say, go down the rabbit hole and decided I really had to write a book. I'm probably getting the years wrong on this. It was probably 2018 and 2019. And what I, I thought I've got to write a book, but I was still holding back because like, why? Why go into this horrible fight where these horrible people who are going to call you a bigot and slur you as racist and, you know, just make up absolute lies about you and things and also possibly risk my job and clearly have to take unpaid leave from a well-paid job to do something that wouldn't make the money back and things. And then it was meeting kids who had detransitioned. That was what got me over the hump to decide I really had to write the book. Because at that point, it was just completely clear. You know, there are kids who are being told that they're really a member of the opposite sex inside and their lives are being shaped in bad ways by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a intimidating topic to venture into because we've all seen how brutal the backlash is. And we know women who've lost their jobs. We know women, lots of women who've been threatened. We know women who've even, you know, experienced violence as a, as a result of trying to talk about these issues, um, particularly, you know, how trans activism and gender identity ideology impact women. Um, but I mean, let's sort of go back to the beginning. In your research, what did you find in terms of the, the beginnings of this concept even of transsexualism, of, you know, changing sex? So like a lot of highly unusual ways to feel about ourselves, these things pop up in tiny numbers around the place. They're, they're, they've always been the occasional person who has you know, stumbled on the idea of starving themselves as a way to express their distress, or who has felt that um, you know, cutting themselves will let the, the pain out. Um, but those things turn into social contagions if other people learn about them, and then they decide that those are um, socially acceptable and socially understood ways of expressing whatever it is they feel the need to express. So holding that thought in mind, there have always been the occasional people who have felt that they really are in some sense members of the opposite sex, that they were meant to be. Often they're gay. Gay people we know, often as children in particular, think that they were meant to be members of the opposite sex before they even have really easily named sexual feelings. They know there's something different about them and and they often misinterpret that as meaning that they were meant to be members of the opposite sex. But also there are just adults who think this. But those things just popped up here and there in tiny numbers. And you can see them occasionally in stories in, from history. And then in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there became a more organised movement, it was, which was mostly about gay rights, in fact. It was mostly to say that it wasn't disordered or shouldn't be criminal to uh, desire members of the same sex. But what they understood that as you being was being a psychic hermaphrodite is what they called it. 
So humans can't be hermaphrodites. We're not able to be both sexes in one body. Some animals can be. Um, so it's an offensive term really to use for a person, but it's the old fashioned term for somebody who has uh, features of both sexes physically. And these doctors, uh, the ones in Germany in particular, thought that being gay was like being a psychic or a psychologically intersex person. And into that same category, they put these rare people that they met occasionally who would say to them, I really think I'm meant to be a member of the opposite sex, in particular, the men who felt they were meant to be women. And over several decades, a sort of theory was built up medically to suggest that this you know, was a disorder. They understood it to be a disorder, but they thought homosexuality was too but that they were disorders that were best fixed by fixing the body, not the mind, that they didn't think they could fix the mind. That's really true, by the way, that you probably can't fix the mind. This is not easy to, this, this, this idea, once it's become very deep set, is very hard to shift. But you can't really change sex. And it's not clear to me when I look back at the history of these German and then American doctors, to what extent they really thought that they were changing sex and to what extent they thought that they were just helping people to live more comfortably in their own sex, probably vary from doctor to doctor. So that's the medical history. And then we reach the 1990s and it comes up against nascent uh, shift to identitarianism rather than identity politics on the left. And it comes up to queer theory on campuses where um, it's seen as automatically good to overturn boundaries or to dissolve boundary, or boundaries or seen as liberatory to say that a thing that's that if you have a binary that you smash it, even if that binary is a natural thing like male and female. And these things kind of cooked up together into what we see now. And you have, to, you have to throw in a bunch of other things like the arrival of the internet, American polarization, American political power that spreads ideas all over the world, especially ideas that come from American universities, American corporations, American internet giants. And you arrive at a point where you've got, to go back to the first thing I said, a psychic contagion. You've got this idea that a few people had spontaneously separated from each other, and now it's meant to be the way that we all understand ourselves. And that idea is kind of sold to people. It's sold to them through the medical profession, schools, the media, really everywhere. You know, you're a bigot if you don't go along with it. And that idea, as I say in the very first sentence of the book, or the second sentence actually, is the idea that what makes you a man or a woman is how you feel and what you say, rather than just this immutable thing that you were conceived. So that's the potted history. You, know, you don't need to read the book now to your audience. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a very good way to sell your book. <laughs> oh, I'm joking. <laughs> Hopefully I've just crushed their appetites. I mean, there's so much more. And obviously, you know, in the book, you, you detail in great detail how we got to this point. Um, I mean, a lot of people, I'm, I'm always sort of, I, I have a really hard time answering this question, which is yes, like, I, I, how I too, did this happen? I too. And it's the yeah. question that everybody asks, you know, like, how did we get here? And they expect, I don't know, they expect um, like one thing, but it's not one thing, is it? Nothing like this comes from one thing. No. There has to be a confluence of factors, really. I mean, I do, I will say that I do, I mean, there's a couple things that I go to, one of which is academia and my gender studies, queer theory, you know, and, and the theory that people like Judith Butler were putting forward, you know, that gender was a, is a social construct. And that's actually, you know, a semi-reasonable argument that gender is a social construct, but it was conflated with sex, of course. And this thing that, you know, everything, like everybody is fluid and you kind of determine your own identity. I mean, it's hard for me to actually even explain gender or Judith Butler's theory because it, theory, makes, no it makes no sense and her yes. writing is so full of jargon and illogical and, and bad, like it's bad writing. It's, I mean, a lot of academic writing is bad writing and it's not, it's not, it doesn't exist for people to understand. <laughs> <laughs> and her her writing is particularly difficult to understand, so it's very strange to me that it's become mainstreamed in a way. Um, so that's yeah, that's part of it. I mean, and and did you find that there was sort of like I don't know an uptick in uh, people starting to identify as transgender or public co more mainstream conversations about transgenderism once gender studies and queer theory started discussing these ideas. Oh, yeah. Completely, completely. And I mean, the, you know, the, it's not it's not that people went to a lecture by Judith Butler and came out and said, I'm trans. It's that there are ideas that if they don't even ever occur to you, they're just not there. People go blissfully through their lives, never thinking of certain things. And then someone suggests them to them and it's like a door opened in their mind. And of course, that can be wonderful. That can be liberating. 
like somebody says to a woman from a very highly traditional family, you know, you could go to university too, or, you know, you could learn, you could write, you could be an artist, whatever, that's amazing. But sometimes those ideas aren't so good, like suggest selling um, eating disorders to teenage girls. Like we know for absolute certainty that they, these, these things are not only contagious, but they were suggest sold under the guise of um, telling kids what not to do. You don't say to teenage girls, oh, be very careful. There are kids who get so obsessed with their weight, you know, that they starve themselves. And this is how they make themselves sick. And, you know, this is the sort of thing to watch out for. And then they exercise too much and blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you suggest sold that idea like to the girls. And, and that really happens. Like one of my friends told me, she's a bit younger than me. I fortunately was old enough that I wasn't given any of this sort of instruction at school. But she said when she was about 14, they had a sort of a school lecture on the subject of eating disorders so that they could all look out for each other. And they watched this video about it. And one of the things that it said in it is that um, kids with eating disorders sometimes use their toothbrush to stick it down their throat to make themselves sick. And she said to me, I swear to God, there were 12 girls in my class sticking their toothbrush down their throat the following week. And that idea would never have occurred to them. So putting the idea out there that if you're distressed and if you feel odd about your body and you don't feel right and you feel different from everybody else and in particular, that difference centers around whether you feel like a proper girl or a proper boy. Like, are you sufficiently manly? Are you sufficiently girl-like? You know, suggesting to people that there's an answer to that that isn't just shit happens or, you know, teenage years are hard or, you know, let's talk about what's wrong, you know, what's happening with your family or whatever. Suggesting to them that there's actually an explanation that's a single kind of appealing because it's so, it's so intellectually appealing if you don't think about it you're just a boy in a girl's body or a girl in a boy's body. And once that's recognized, everything else will be fixed. So that was the idea that got sold in particular to, to kids and to teenagers. And so of course you're going to see a big uptick in it. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, if people just start calling you he instead of she, that's going to resolve all these troubled feelings. If you just start dressing like a boy, maybe if you start taking hormones or get a mastectomy, like this is what your problem is. This how you, this is how you fix it. Oh, perfect, easy. Thank goodness there's a solution. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And, and, sorry, go ahead. No, you go on. I was gonna say, like, I mean, the other thing that you know that people have said to me in terms of like the answer to that question of like how did we get here especially in terms of this like this trend of kids transitioning which has really blown up recently um was the idea that it was you know there are adults particularly males who had transitioned who wanted to transition many of whom were um autogonophiles and they wanted this concept to be legitimized in the same way that, you know, homosexuality was um, legitimized. I mean, as it should be, um, <laughs> but partly through that argument of born this way, right? So this is me, I, this is who I am, like accept me as I am, which again is, is, a, is a positive thing when we're talking about gay men and lesbians, but, um, I think that I, I, it, the the trans movement glommed onto that idea and just said, you know, this is this is me, this is who I am, you know, this is my inherent identity or whatever. And you know, so in, if that's the case, then there do have to be trans kids because you were always this way. You were always uh, a woman trapped yeah. in a man's body. At one point, you were a boy or a girl trapped in a boy's body. Yeah. So I think that desire to be seen by everybody else as a member of the opposite sex. And if you go along with Ray Blanchard, and I find him very, very convincing, um, the Canadian sexologist who coined the phrase autogynophilia, as you know, um, these people either occur naturally or they're created by some social forces, we don't have to say which, but anyway, it's a sexuality effectively. And that sexuality is an inwardly directed desire, but it's a heterosexual desire, so that's confusing. So you desire yourself in the form of the opposite sex. And that is a desire that if it's named or discussed or brought out into the cold light of day, it's destroyed. It's a bit like catching sight of yourself looking, you know, not at all like your fantasy when you're in a beautiful fantasy, you know. Um, so, so you mustn't talk about it. It's something, you, you know, it's the love that uh, would really rather you did not speak its name in Alice Drager's excellent expression in her book. Um, 
So that to me is like the, the, the bit of grit that is in the oyster that the pearl forms around. And if that wasn't there, then I don't think the pearl would have formed at all. So all those other things that I said, I mean, I just sort of glossed over it by saying that there have always been some people occasionally who've settled on the idea that they were members of the opposite sex. But actually, some of those people, what the desire is, is to be seen by everybody else as members of the opposite sex. It's not something that can just be fixed by, um, for example, privately cross-dressing or even having surgery to remove parts of your body or change parts of your body that cause you huge amounts of distress. It's really something that requires all of society to accommodate you. So it's a really totalitarian need. And in particular, it causes all sorts of contradictions. So if you if you say that somebody's born this way, well, they may be, but that's neither here nor there. Gay people may or may not be born this way. I happen to believe they mostly are. But that's not why we accept homosexuals. The reason we accept homosexuals is no harm, no skin off anyone else's nose. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, paedophiles might be born this way, but we're not going to accept it. Uh, so the, this one, the problem is that you can't just say you have to accept me as a woman when you're not a woman, because it requires everybody else to accept you as a woman. And then that destroys things for them, you know. So you, 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 you reach a point that you don't reach with homosexuality, where you're requiring everybody else to go along with something. Right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I, I think that m many of us, I mean, this is how I feel is, you know, if this were really just about individuals living their lives as they wanted to live their lives, I mean, and dress how they want to dress or even get surgeries or whatever, I mean, that's your choice. You can change your name if you want to. You can grow your hair long. You can wear makeup. You can do whatever you want in your own home in as far as your fetishes go, as long as you're not, you know, hurting other people. Um, but it's this demand that everyone else participate and everyone go along with it and this insistence that everyone else has to say, yes, you are literally a woman. You're literally female. And that's, you know, where the real problems began. So I think there probably were people who very strongly desired that and have been for a long time. But they just weren't living in a society that accommodated it. And after decades and decades of effort, because you can look back and you can see early seeds of the legal efforts that have borne such success for, um, for gender activists in the 2010s. You can see the early seeds of them, certainly in the 1990s, but also earlier. You know, there really were tiny groups of people who would have seemed delusional to everybody at the time who were drafting things called stuff like, um, you know, International Bill of Transgender Rights or that sort of thing, in which they would say very reasonable things like nobody should be fired because of how they choose to dress or present themselves, mixed in with totally nutty things like uh, all spaces should be um, open to people, you know, independent of uh, biology, but based on gender. So you know, they're mixing up the things like, um, you know, sex segregated sports that are there for a reason and the things like wearing makeup or wearing a dress that are there, maybe for reasons or not, but anyway, it's just pretty harmless to, to break those rules. Yeah, you know, they're mixing up the rules that it matters to break and the, matters, the rules it doesn't matter to break all in one go. And, you know, those people really had this agenda completely sorted in the 1990s. You can look back and read the documents. And somehow, and I think that somehow does include queer theory, includes a lot of money. Oh yeah, it includes um, winning gay marriage and a bunch of big institutional charities that could see themselves being, you know, defunded out of existence. Uh, you know, when gay marriage uh, was passed in places like America and Canada and the UK, that was the greatest um, cause to attract money, really, gay mm -hmm. marriage, because um, gay men are quite well off compared with straight men and certainly compared with gay women, just because, you know, men are paid more and they just generally don't have kids in the family and there's two men. So, so they're people with a lot of spare income and perfectly reasonably they want to be able to formalise their, um, you know, their relationship. But also any campaigner will tell you that a clear, single, easily defined goal that can be affected by a judge saying yes or by a law being passed, that's much easier to campaign for than, say, ending domestic violence or um, you know, improving... Um, you know, finding abused children and helping them or something like that, which is nebulous and you know it'll never be done. You know, it'll never be ended. We'll never get to the end of it, the suffering. So so that was a great thing to campaign for and money poured in for any organisation that was campaigning for that. And then when they won it, wonderful, but they didn't all just want to pack up their tents and go home. They needed a next cause. And by then there were people and ha who had been for years knocking on their door and saying, well, the next cause is transgender people. They're the next 
mm. oppressed minority. And it sounds reasonable. That's what I believed first, too. And I do think, by the way, that people who present as members of the opposite sex do have their specific needs. And, you know, are people who are exper experience, you know, violence, discrimination, harassment, mockery, all of these things that are unpleasant. And so I, I do think there's good work to be done there, actually. But again, they focused on a quick, easy, well, not easy necessarily, but a quick in the sense of easy, in the sense that it's very easy to define legal fix. So their equivalent of gay marriage, which by, is not by any means the whole of gay rights. You know, gay people still face homophobia. They still have you know, healthcare needs and so on. Um, the equivalent of that for transgender rights just became gender self-identification. That in law and in practice and in everyday life, you were who you said you were and everyone else had to go along with that. That it was bigotry not to go along with that. And if you don't think too hard and too carefully, that can sound OK. It's not until you say to somebody, so does that mean that men can be in women's sports so that you're going to put rapists in women's jails? Or, you know, what about a, girl, a boy in your daughter's changing rooms? They go, oh, oh I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. Some of them apparently don't say that. They say, you're a bigot. <laughs> but anyway, to my astonishment. Well, it's been framed as an issue of human rights, right? So it's like, well, yes, they should have rights. These people are marginalized, yeah, they don't have rights, so give them rights. Do they not have any yeah. inner eye, I wonder? Like, are they not seeing what you're, what you're saying? Like, when you say, do you want a man to go into the changing room where your teenage daughter is and take off all her clothes, if you want to put it that way, and shower? And, you know, but then as soon as you get, the, the more explicit you get in that, like, the more you try to get the person to imagine what they are actually saying, you sound like you're obscene. Like, yeah. you're the one who has to say... Like, you know, why are you talking about that penises person, all the time? Exactly. That you're person has a penis. Genitalia. What if they have an erection? Now I sound like a pervert. Yeah. And they say things like, don't look at people's genitals. It's like crying out loud. Like, we've understood that flashing was a crime until a half a second ago. But yeah. now suddenly, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. It's you, When you talk about these things, we like, we get accused of being, like, obsessed with genitals. And, like, you know, why are you talking about penises all the time? And it's like, well, because... This is the reality, like you're talking about. And because you've about... stolen the word I was using. You know, I was <laughs> using the polite word, man. <laughs> and you're stopping me from using that. So I have to use something. So now you're making yeah. me say penises. <laughs> yeah, man doesn't mean anything. Now it's a woman. So then we have to talk about specifics about the body, yes. right? The yes. male body. There's like, what's the difference between the male body and the female body? One and of the main differences. That one down. Yeah. They're chasing that one down too now. You know, I don't know if you saw um, when Selena Soul, who's the one of the Connecticut runners, one of the teenage girls who's taking the legal case um, to in a, to an American court to try to maintain sex segregated sex segregated sports and to stop it going to gender self identification as it already already has in Connecticut. She wrote an op ed for USA Today. And it was very polite and it just said, you know, male people don't belong in female sports. And after it was published under pressure from activists, they changed it without asking her, without even telling her to take out the words male and female throughout. And so they had her right, instead of her saying, you know, these particular people are male, which is a fact. They identify as girls, which is all well and good, completely fine. But that doesn't mean that they can race as females. That got changed to these trans girls can't run with cis girls. So it makes you, it turns you into a transphobe. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think Selena's soul cares at all whether somebody's trans. She cares whether they're male. Right. And, you know, and this is what they've done, and it's super manipulative, which is to say, in, in terms of this sports issue in particular, they've said, oh, well, you know, these, these people are trying to keep trans people out of sports. Or they talk about, like, fighting for trans people to be able to participate in sport. And it's like, no, no one's talking about whether or not people who identify as trans can play sports or participate in sport. We're really literally just talking about males who want to compete against females. It doesn't matter how they identify. And there's it, this doesn't go in the other direction, right? It's not no, that exactly. girls and women yeah. are trying to compete in men's sports. It really is specifically about males and females. And when you frame it as trans and in this like context of inclusion and you're trying to keep trans people out of sports, it completely changes the the conversation and you know how you can speak about these issues so i think the previous civil rights movements i mean as i say in the book i don't think this is a civil rights movement and i explain why but it looks like one so if you look at former civil rights movements what you see is an, an oppressed group that ask reasonably to have or demand to have the same as the dominant group so women asked to get the vote black people don't want the jim crow laws Gay people want to be able to marry the person they love, like straight people. And that's a sort of a self-contained thing. 
in the sense that we already know it works because it works for the dominant group. So you give it to the, the subjugated group, you know the world doesn't fall apart. Like the world doesn't fall apart when people vote, so why would it fall apart when women vote? But the difference with this one, I, I was thinking about this just today, there was this idea in medieval alchemy that there could exist and that they could maybe find a universal acid. So that would be something that could eat through absolutely anything. And if you imagine that there was a universal acid, well, how could you hold it in a, you know, in a beaker? It would eat through that, and then it would eat through the table and the floor, and then down through to the centre of the earth. You know, it would never stop. So if, if there was such a thing, it would dissolve everything. And I think of this ideology as a bit like that because it destroys everything else. It's not something that everybody else has. Like everybody else doesn't have the right to go around saying they're things they're not. We haven't tested that. The dominant group can't walk around the place saying, you know, I am a reindeer, I am, you know, invisible, I can fly, you know, I am immortal, you know, any of those things. You, can, you can't say that you're things that you're not and insist that everybody else accepts them. And now we're trying to give the small group that right. We've never tested that. We don't know what society looks like when you let people just go around the place absolutely insisting everybody else goes along with what they say. And it turns out that what it does is it breaks everything. It just ruins everything. And it ruins language too, like this inclusion, this word inclusion. I was thinking about that today as well. I was thinking about the sports thing. People keep saying like, you know, we must be inclusive. So we must have Laurel Hubbard competing in the women's weightlifting. So Laurel Hubbard is a male who competed really quite poorly as a male, as a weightlifter, is, you know, in their 40s, you know, but managed to get to the Olympics, like which no women in their 40s managed to do. The, the other people are all 18 to 22, basically, you know, there were these enormously strong young Samoan women and, um, you know, from Tonga and places where they're just really, really strong. And um, and this, this, this person goes there and it's meant to be inclusion. But if you think about it, this person wasn't excluded before. There was a category for them, the male category. It was totally open to them already. They just weren't good enough. But actually somebody was excluded and namely a female person who should have gone in Laurel Hubbard's place. Mm -hmm. So it's lit it's literally, you call it inclusion, but it's actually the exact opposite, it's exclusion. And this, I saw that so many times when I was writing the book that not just were things different from what they were described as, they were actually the exact opposite. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I and, and you know, there's different reasons, there's different reasons that people transition. Yes. You write about um, Michael Bailey and Ray Blanchard's research into boys or men who transition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course they found that there was, you know, uh, there were the effeminate homosexual boys who tended to transition early. And then that the adult men who transitioned tended to be heterosexual men who were the autogonophiles. Um, but that's, you know, the, and I think in the past, if I'm, I think this is correct, that in the past it was more common for men to transition to women than for women to be transitioning to men. But that's changed pretty recently. Is that right? Yeah. So in general, um, when societies allow people to move out of the category that they are supposed to be in, I put supposed to be in inverted commas, it's it's the dom it's it's the, it's the dominant group that's allowed to identify out. So black people can't identify as white. I mean, talking in a racist society here, you can't identify out of slavery, but there would be nothing stopping you going the other direction. You probably wouldn't want to because it's miserable, but there's nothing stopping you. So lots of traditional societies have ways in which highly effeminate gay men, same sex attracted men, because they often don't have a category in their in their concepts for gay, are allowed to identify out of manhood rather than sully it. And that, that's been allowed, but very rarely the other direction. They haven't said that, you know, highly non-feminine, um, masculine type women who, you know, fancy owning the farm and doing the voting and, you know, running things and bossing everyone else around and being the head of the family, that she can identify as a man. No, that's never allowed because that would be gaining privilege. So women haven't been allowed to gain privilege. Males have been allowed to lose it if that gives them something else they value even more, namely a, a way to live as a homosexual and not to have to fit into very masculine strictures that don't suit them. So that's why traditionally, you know, you would expect to see if it was just a question of, you know, homosexual people in societies that don't have a concept of gay, you would expect it to go both ways, but actually it can only go one way because you're not allowed to identify into privilege. I mean, all women would have identified into privilege if they were allowed. Um, so that there's a, there's a, the, the exceptions always are so um, enlightening 
there are a couple of societies that have allowed women to identify out of womanhood. Um, Albania was one, um, and it, it was because those are societies where children are promised in marriage, in particular girls are promised very young in marriage, and also places where they have blood feuds, where, where brothers have to kill, you know, to, to maintain um, honour, and also places where they're highly, um, just only the, the sons inherit. So if you have a woman who is in a family where there are only girls, the family may decide to, to let one of the girls identify as a boy in order that she can inherit. Or if you were a girl who was sort of basically given away in marriage when you were three, when you grew up and you can't bear this idea, the only way to get out of it is to identify as a boy. And you must swear never to have children and never to marry because that would be too disruptive to get pregnant in that category. But at least it means the brothers don't have to kill each other. So it's just a completely different thing. Like it's just, it's allowing a few women to escape from a situation where people are literally going to slaughter each other. Whereas the men are allowed to identify out of privilege in order that they can live in a way that they find more congenial. So that was a long answer to why it was more men than women, historically speaking. And then this autogynophilia thing does just seem to really be a male thing. Like there isn't really, or at least so Blanchard found, there isn't really an equivalent for females. So that's this new, the, the recent um, huge increase in girls in particular, it's not mostly adult women, it's, it's girls transitioning is something new. This is the thing that didn't exist before. This is the social contagion. So often these girls are heterosexual, um, loads of autistic or autistic spectrum disorder kids, um, kids who would otherwise have been, you know, eating disorders, kids who um, have experienced abuse or neglect and who find in this an identity that they can fit into. And just like some quite ordinary kids who had the bad luck to be on, on Tumblr around 2015 where, you know, everybody was pushing this message, you know, have you, have you interrogated your gender? What is your gender? Have you thought about your gender? And anyone can make themselves feel diseased if they think too hard in a ruminative manner. And, you know, you, you, if, you start, if you start to think, like, does my head hurt? And you think it and you keep thinking it, your head will start to hurt. It really will. So it's a bit like that. You start to get this idea like, oh, God, maybe my gender isn't. Maybe I'm not cis after all. Like, oh, could I be a gender? Could I be? You know? So it, it suggests selling the identity. Yeah, so historically it could only work one way, like by and large, from male to female. And recently it's this social contagion. And it turns out that if you give girls a chance to identify out of being a girl, it seems like rather a lot of them want to do it. I wonder why. Yeah, and I mean, I, th I think a lot of it has to do with, I mean, there's, there's a number of issues because I know that, you know, it, it's connected to girls going through puberty and then beginning to experience sexual harassment and, you know, adult men are staring at them and commenting. Some In some cases, they're being molested or sexually abused. And so to me, it does make sense that they would want to sort of escape from what they see as, you know, they see it as their body's fault. You know, they start to develop women's bodies and then all these terrible things begin to happen to them. Um, yeah. And then, of course, there's the the issue of young lesbians who are feeling different than, you know, the other girls are different than how perhaps they feel they should feel. And they're offered this supposed solution, which is, you know, it's still it's still not a popular thing to be a lesbian. It's not cool no. to be a lesbian. And, you know, gay and lesbian uh, kids, as in proto-gay and proto-lesbian kids, the ones who are destined to announce to the world at some point uh, that that's who, who they are, they don't know that themselves, but they often do know that they're different. And on average, they um, they have quite gender non-conforming tastes. So you can see if people are explaining to a three or four or six or seven year old kid that what makes you a girl is, you know, liking pink and all this bullshit you can totally imagine the sorts of things and he thinks that I like all of those things and I do feel like I'm different I don't really feel like I'm very like the other boys and they don't know why their body hasn't told them yet well I mean they've just been told the answer by the people they trust their teachers and doctors and maybe their parents as well because their parents think that it's the um that it's the progressive thing to do and and so then you know before any chance to just have your body unfold to you what it is that's been making you feel different, you've gone down a different path. So I think that the lesbian and gay um, men thing, that's that's the very symmetric bit. I think, you know, the reason that lesbian, the reason that a lesbian might identify as a man or a gay man might identify as a woman, they're quite symmetric. Autogynophilia seems to be really very much on one side, men only. And the the, the self-harming, miserable, kind of confused Tumblr 
social justice discovered this on Tumblr, you know, that that person's quite quite often female. And so in the book, I sort of give those four different groups. And I feel I left out one group, actually, um, a group that I didn't really become aware of. I think it's a more recent group and it's a more even more hidden group is um, young men, teenage men who maybe are autistic spectrum disorder, um, maybe very nerdy, uh, you know, socially awkward kids, um, play too many computer games, find the idea maybe of presenting as a girl or a woman kind of exciting because they aren't actually talking to any girls and women very much except their mums maybe. And we don't even know who these people are really because even the talk about detransitioners, and as you know, if you try to talk about detransition, that's in itself meant to be transphobic. But the ones we do talk about are girls. We hardly ever hear about the boy transition detransitioners, but there are some. And so I feel that's a gap in my book. I think that that needs to be written about more. And there are people who are starting to write. There were very good articles in Quillette. I don't know if you saw them, a series about uh, boys who identify as girls and why they do that. And, you know, heterosexual boys, I mean, and not, and not boys who had been particularly uh, effeminate and not boys that, as far as we can tell, or what a gynephile we wouldn't necessarily know. Yeah, so there's, there's a whole thing there. It's like an internet created disease, which we know exists. I mean, I saw a paper just the other day about a type of Tourette's that's created by playing particular computer games. You know, it teaches you to tick. And yeah, I think that, I think we're making ourselves sick and I think we're making our kids sick by telling them nonsense about humans. Yeah, and I think, I find it particularly troubling the way that this ideology is being pushed in schools. Um, you know, in many cases it's, you know, the schools will essentially socially transition kids without even telling their parents. You oh, that's know, right. They'll determine that these kids are trans and so start using the opposite pronouns and maybe even use a different name. And the parents are in the dark that the, the, the teachers in these schools are are telling these kids, this is, you know, oh, here, this is what you are. We're going along with it. Everyone here has to go along with it. And I mean, they're kids, like they don't know any better. And also like, it's cool. Like it's a cool thing to do right now. And it's the, you know, we know we've all been teenagers. We know that teenagers are always seeking a unique identity. I'm this, I'm this, I'm like, and you know, when I was in high school, it was like, I'm like a skater or like I'm yeah. like a skid or, you know, you attach yourself to like grunge or whatever it is. And usually it's just about how you look and the people that you hang out with and the kind of music you listen to and yada, yada, yada. There's like goth, which happens sort of like after my time a little bit. Um, but, you know, teenagers, like they want to be unique. They feel that they're different and special and they kind of want attention and they want to they want to participate in something. They want to be a part of something. And this is no different, except that adults are fueling it and legitimizing it. And it's it's not just an identity that then just goes away because what we're talking about is physical changes. We're talking about giving these kids puberty blockers, hormones, and maybe surgeries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one good thing, and this is a, it's a very much a one silver lining is that as soon as teachers and schools are saying that this is what it's all about, it stops being cool. So I think the fashion element of it is ruined by schools pushing it. And I take some comfort for that, especially from the teenagers. Of course, that won't help with the young kids who implicitly believe what they're told by the adults in their lives, which is pretty bad. Yeah. Can we, I mean, can we talk a bit about the impact of transitioning on kids? I mean, you reference in your book, Jazz Jennings, and this yeah. is like such a sad story to me. And it's not treated like a sad story. No, but I it's know. pretty it's disturbing. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I perennially try to think, how can people think this strange thing? How can people be saying this thing that's so obviously to me is a grotesque human rights abuse, a little gay boy sterilized? And paraded around the front of the world, in front of the world, while this was happening, I, I, it's just extraordinary to me that this is possible. Uh, so, for people who don't know, Jazz, Jazz um, first said that he was a girl when he was about three. I, I'm not even pretending to try to use pronouns for a three-year-old; it's ridiculous. Jazz is a boy, and I, you know, got paraded around on television at six or seven with parents who clearly, or you know, presented themselves as being very um, 
you know, very progressive people, very supportive, put on puberty blockers, put on cross-sex hormones around 13, all of this in reality TV, like really exploitative stuff, you know, going around surgeons talking about uh, inverting the penis to make a neovaginal cavity and all this sort of stuff, like for camera, I just can't, it's just extraordinary to me that any of this seems like social justice. Had the surgery at 18, it wasn't very successful, more surgeries, blah, blah, blah. And um, Jazz now has revealed that, um, it, that Jazz has a, sorry, Jazz has a, a, a depressive disorder, like, and you know, it's like, well, I'm really sorry to hear that, but I'm just really not sure how this sort of life prepares somebody for a healthy, happy adulthood, you know? The whole thing is just so exploitative. Yeah, so that's the, that's the sort of extreme example. And I mean, and, and jazz. Sense. Yeah, but it so. makes sense if you think that jazz is a girl trapped in a boy body. That's yeah. that's the thing. That's you know, why, how can people be thinking all of this? I'm always trying to think like, how can people that I know are not bad people, that I know are trying to do the best that they can. They're not stupid. I agree with them on lots and lots of things, and they still think that this is either a beautiful story or that was the best that could be done for a child with a really difficult situation. And the answer is they genuinely think that in some metaphysical sense, there's a girl in there. And if there's really a girl in there, then why wouldn't you try to release that girl? And they think that this is what is going to make this kid happy. Like they've been yeah. told that if they don't participate in this and they they'll don't be suicide. let these, yeah, don't let these kids yeah. transition, they'll, yeah. they'll kill themselves or they'll be miserable for the rest of their lives. And so people, yeah. so that makes sense. It's like, you don't want people to kill themselves. Also, you want people to be happy. But I mean, the reality with jazz. Is and jazz is not happy. Well, and yeah. he's never going to be able to experience sexual pleasure. Like he's not so going to be able to. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like his his genitals yeah, so I, I think, weird to you know, talk about him. So, 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 so for this particular, yeah, let's move away from talking about one particular yeah. kid. But I yeah. mean, the reason for mentioning jazz is that anyone who wants can go and watch any of these programs and see it for themselves. You know, we're not making it up. We're not exaggerating it. But let's just talk in, in more general terms. I think, mm -hmm. you know, why would someone either suggest this or go along with it? There are lots of true believers. There are people who have absolutely bought into the idea that in some sense you can be trapped in the wrong body. And when you say trapped in the wrong body, they say that you're simplifying it, that you're exaggerating what they say, but that's how they act. Everything that they do is basically is predicated on that. That's clear. And then there's people who haven't thought about it very hard, but you know, like you say, they don't want to be mean. They're not horrible people, they're good people, and this is what they've been told is good. And then there's people, absolutely definitely, who regard this as a chance for quite performative uh, activism. You know, it's again to compare it with difficult things like, say, helping traveler families or um, you know, trying to stop domestic violence. This is really easy. You just put your pronouns in your bio, you add a rainbow flag or, you know, or the, the transgender flag to your name, you call yourself an ally, you ask people their pronouns at the beginning of meetings or whatever. You know, it's just super easy. You post on social media like yeah. trans rights are human rights. Yeah, yeah. Or even the, or even the more obvious trans women are women. Ones. Yeah, like sometimes they really look, read like catechism, you know, and they say them in, in call and response. Have you ever seen those videos in, in protests or in marches, like trans women are women, and everyone goes, trans women are women. And I was brought up Catholic, and it sounds very familiar. And <laughs> yeah, or you, um, or there's ones like trans, trans is beautiful, or even trans is sacred. And you're like, God, this is so very religious. And then, you know, there's just the shit posters who come in as well. Like, this is where to be if you like to shout rude words at women. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very attractive. And you may not be somebody who knows that you like shouting or who quite acknowledges that you like shouting rude words at women. There's a joke going around in um, in Britain as we're talking at the moment. Is a, you know, as you know, we have this big gay rights charity, Stonewall, that just went trans, and trans tra only trans all the time in about 2015. And the founders fell out quite publicly over this. Because some of them thought this is a big mistake and that you know women need to be able to talk about single sex spaces and other ones said that's bigotry and one of the ones who said that's bigotry michael cashman uh, tweeted about this yesterday and this extraordinary tweet which had wonderful mixed metaphors i love mixed metaphors i'm a connoisseur of them in writing you know i enjoyed them when journalists file them and copy and he said that uh, women were uh, that, that um, the, a company that had left the stonewall scheme had been persuaded by the shrill sirens who had weaseled their way in and this is just so like shrill sirens. Michael, what are you telling yourself? Telling us about what you think about women. Shrill sirens. Anyway, we're going to set up a women's choir 
call the shrill sirens because why not that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so, so if you don't like women very much or if you just love a bit of aggro this is a great place to be yeah i mean the the trans activists really seem to hate women yeah you know, a, mix, a mixture again it's a mixture but if you hate women this is the place to be I'd, I'd put it that way around i don't think all trans activists hate women i think if you hate women why would you not be a trans activist Sure, I mean, yeah, that's fair. Not all trans activists hate women, but exactly, it's provided this place to, you know, project all of your rage at women in a way that's viewed as progressive, that's legitimate, that's perfectly fine. Because, you know, the people that you're hating, these people they call TERFs, uh, which, are, you know, these are, this, that's like a slur that's applied to you and I, despite the fact that, you know, I don't, I'm not excluding anybody from anything. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, talk about facts and reality and protect women's rights. But, you know, it, we're, we're so bad and we're so dangerous and we're so harmful that it's totally justifiable to scream at us, to say hateful things to us, to threaten us, to bully us, to silence us. To, to try and get people us. to lose their jobs. I mean, that's the big one, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what totalitarians always started with. I mean, that was true in, you know, in Soviet era, it was true even as the Nazis were coming to power. The first thing that you did, the first thing you threatened was somebody's uh, livelihood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very scary, it's extremely scary to think that you might lose your job. Yeah. I wonder if, well, and of course, this is why so many women don't speak out about yeah. this issue because they really fear for their livelihood, which is, you know, it's a big deal. It's your survival. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you think that there is actually any legitimacy to the concept of gender dysphoria. So, you know, this, this idea of gender dysphoria, you know, it's changed a lot in terms of how we're allowed to talk about it just within, you know, a few years. It used to yeah. be in like the DSM as like, a, a form of mental illness, I think. Um, and now it's like, you can't even say that it's a mental yeah, illness. Yeah, it's just natural variation. There's just gender variation. And until you have transitioned, you, you may feel some dysphoria. Mm -hmm. Or you may not. There are people who just declare, you know, very happy the way that I am, but, you know, actually I'm a man. And yeah. you just all have to go along with that, so. Well, and I just, I mean, I guess, to, like, to me, part of the problem with gender dysphoria is that I have a problem with the term itself, because I think that it would be more accurate to talk about it as, like, body dysmorphia, because if you genuinely feel that you're trapped in the wrong body, and you, you can't stand the body that you have, and you need a new body, then I think that would be a kind of, you know, mental condition or something mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm, wherein... Mm -hmm that could be ca called like body dysmorphia or something like that. But it, cause it's not really about gender. I, I mean, mean, to the extent that it might be about gender, you straight away see how regressive it is because somebody could mm -hmm. feel trapped, not just in the wrong body, but in the wrong social role. And the answer to the social role one is just, you know, screw social roles, do what the hell you want. So once you start to unpack it, you realize how many things have been bundled together into this simple seeming term. You know, if you feel uncomfortable with being seen as a woman, what does that mean? I mean, it says something about society rather than you, really. You know, you just are a woman. It's just a fact. It's just the way you are. And if other people look at you and see something like, you know, potential rape victim, person who makes coffee at meetings, uh, you know, someone we can get legitimately enraged with if she demands her rights, uh, thick, you know, whatever. That's society's fault, not you. Although, of course, I can see why someone would want to escape from it. And, and gender dysphoria puts that discomfort onto you and takes it out of society. So I think it's part of an intensely individualist way of thinking about people, which comes up in many places in my book, that, that we are sort of atomized people who can remake ourselves, that we aren't evolved creatures who have a natural, you know, a natural nature, if I can repeat my word. And that doesn't mean everyone's the same. It doesn't mean we can't transcend it. It doesn't mean that we don't also have intelligence. It just means we are a certain type of animal. You know, we're a mammal, we're related to monkeys very closely, et cetera, et cetera. And instead, you're, you're making yourself. But in that process, you're also denying society and culture around you. You're saying that it's all about you. Everything's about you. You are a self-made creature. Everything you feel is on you and not out there. So it's so many confusions. And you can see in some ways it's kind of attractive because it suggests that you could do anything you want, you could be anything you want, that every problem can be fixed as opposed to saying, this is shit, I live in a society that denigrates women, that's not going to end in my lifetime, 
I can decide to dedicate myself to try to change it, but I'm not going to manage it on my own. You know, that's kind of depressing. Easier to say, oh, you know, that's gender dysphoria. I'm well, not that kind of person. There's some realities that you just can't change. I mean, this is the world yeah. we live in. There's males and females. Maybe yeah, this is the like body. That. Maybe you're born with a body you don't like. And unfortunately, there's not that much that you can do about it. I mean, some people obviously do get cosmetic surgeries and things like that. But, you know, we, we actually that we actually can't control everything about the world around us and about nature. Oh, right. I mean, you know, discomfort with your gender is so far down the list of things that people have, or, or with your sex, I mean. You know, think of all the people who have like spina bifida or, you know, who are paralyzed in accidents, mm. you know, cystic fibrosis or multiple Birth victims, you know. Like there's all yeah. sorts of terrible things that can happen to you and that will destroy your body. Yeah, and nobody says, and you know, that that's some dysphoria that you have. Like people understand that, you know, a bad thing happened. We're going to do our best to help you. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not, it's not changeable. You aren't, you aren't infinitely able to just fix your body. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and the other, the other issue that I have with the concept of gender dysphoria is that I sort of think that everybody probably experiences some form of gender dysphoria at one point in our lives. You know, we don't, we don't feel like, I don't think any of us truly feel that we fit perfectly into these roles of femininity and masculinity in a binary way. Yeah, and this no, concept, and this act, yeah, and this concept and activism acts as though people do when they call us cis that supposedly means that you know i'm a female who identifies with femininity and i want to be like no that's not true that's not who i am i'm not a stereotype you know there's yeah. some things about femininity that maybe i identify with sometimes and other parts that i don't there's some aspects of masculinity that i identify with i mean i even have a problem with this identify with i mean maybe it's my mm -hmm. age but i don't spend my time thinking about what i identify with and right. as and don't you know it just i mean i just am irish that's just a fact and if i in some way was able to repudiate my citizenship and get another one well you know there's still some base reality about having been born and brought up there and that's shaped who i am but i don't identify as Irish or identify with being Irish. It's just ridiculous. You know, I don't identify as someone who has a PhD in mathematics. I just did do a PhD in mathematics. It's just, yeah. I, so, I, and I have another problem with gender dysphoria, even when they still thought of it as a mental illness and it was in the DSM, whatever. It's that it's too many things all muddled up into one. Like once you give mental syndromes names, you shape them. We know that. You know, the, the, the list of things that we call anorexia is different to what looks pretty similar but not the same as anorexia in a different country. Same with depression. Like in some countries, depression will include, you know, a peppery feeling in your stomach that we don't get because that's not our description of depression. So once you have named a disease and shaped it and listed the symptoms, when doctors come and talk to you, to, to patients, and in that conversation, the therapeutic conversation, they shape your symptoms. They actually shape your illness. You both are doing it together. And so gender dysphoria, by naming it and by listing it the way we did, we bundled quite a lot of disparate things, you know, which might be, you know, the discomfort that someone's emerging sexuality is causing them, or might be an impact of trauma or uh, abuse. We're bundling them into a co concept and giving a single name and explanation and list of symptoms to them. And then that's how that person understands themselves. And then that's how they feel. So what they originally went in feeling has changed into something else because of this label. Mm-hmm. One of the things that, you know, it, it is this, this gender identity ideology, this legislation, I think that women have felt particularly enraged by it because it really does impact women more than it impacts yeah. men. You know, this ideology doesn't super harm men as a whole, whereas it really does harm women as a whole. Yeah. And one of the ways that it's harmed women is in terms of these alterations to language where we can't even talk about women anymore. We can't say women, we say menstruators, we say pregnant people, we say chest feeding, we say vagina owners. And people seem not to understand why this matters or might be offensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so strange. I mean, they say, well, you know, what harm are you doing? It's just being inclusive. And the, the stated reason isn't the real reason. So the stated reason is not to miss out trans men. So when you say, you know, I want to have a cervix, a cervical cancer campaign, you say, well, anyone with a cervix should come and get checked. And that's meant to, what we're told is that that's meant to include trans men, namely female people who identify as men. Mm. 
nobody gives a shit about female people who identify as men. They really just don't. Like the only time you ever hear about them is uh, when they're pregnant. Because people just like the photos of this person who looks quite a convincingly man got male. Pregnant. Yeah, with a big no, belly. It's completely absurd. So the reason that I know that it doesn't, that they don't, that it's not about that, is because they don't do this, or hardly at all do this. They've just started to men. Like they don't say, you know, if people with a prostate come and get it checked in case it's cancerous. They just say men. Like all the ads start with only men have a prostate. So they're not including the trans men there, are they? You know, they're not worrying about them there. So the reason for doing it is to leave the words fe female and woman free for any male man person who wants to use them. Mm -hmm. So the words must be taken away from any association with body parts. So the body parts have to be split into pieces and talked about individually. And that, that is offensive. I mean, I really, really imagine, imagine walking into the office and, you know, ticking a form saying I'm a vagina haver or something like this, you know. And anyway, it's just inaccurate. We're not talking about vagina havers, we're talking about women. The reason that people with vaginas and the healthcare of people with cervixes is poor is because they're women. Like women's healthcare has been neglected. If it was, if it was men who had cervixes, we'd be looking after them a lot better. But it isn't, it's women who have cervixes. That's why we don't look after them and we haven't looked after them until recently. So also it attenuates our power as a constituency because it's the same people who have all of these things. Like it, it breaks us up into this sort of provider of services. Like you're describing somebody who's a menstruator, a lactator, a, a gestator, you know, like, like what you're, you, the next thing is clear, you're going to be a surrogate. You know, it's, it's, you're somebody who's just there to be mined for, um, you know, for reproductive and sexual services. You're a possessor of a vagina that somebody might want to penetrate. So now you've been broken up into parts. You're now a, a, a supplier of parts for services, but also you're not somebody you can stand up and say with everybody else who has the same collection of features. You know, we are a force. We are a political group. We have demands. We have needs that are different from the other type of people. You know, they used to be the vote and things, but they still there's still demands and needs. So it's just you're just completely. Well, I was about to say neutered women, but in a way you have, because you've taken away everything that makes a human being female and split it into little bits. Like they don't go together. Like, you know, like, like, we're, like we're bloody made of Lego or something. Like somebody could be a cervix haver and a penis haver. Mm -hmm. No, nobody has ever been that in the whole history of humanity. A menstruator with a scrotum. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, God, no, these things come as a package and the package is called female. And the fact that, you know, some women have hysterectomies or... You know, some women don't menstruate because they have some issue or they're on, you know, long term contraception or something. That doesn't change the package. It's the same package. Mm -hmm. It's just so stupid. That's been the depressing thing about writing this book, having to spend so much time thinking about really stupid and bad faith arguments. Yeah. You know, I, I, I read recently a quote from um, uh, from Toni Morrison that really resonated with me. She talked about one of the bad things about racism from the point of view of the person who's experiencing the racism, is that one of its purposes is to waste your time. So when people say things like, you know, well, there's never been a great black poet, or, you know, you know, on average, black people are not as intelligent as white people, you're then, you then have to waste your time rebutting that and coming up with examples and quoting great black poets and, and so on and so forth. It's not like it's gonna change their mind. You haven't actually achieved anything. You've just wasted, wasted a lot of time. And then they will just go and say all the same things again and you have to re rebut it again. It's Sisyphus labor, you know? So it's a bit like that, that the amount of time that clever women have wasted in the last few years saying idiotic sentences that I could never have believed that I would have to say, like, well, we're not clownfish. You know? Or like a woman is an adult human female or only women yeah. give birth. Yeah, but but I mean the clownfish one is just so emblematic of the <laughs> foolishness of it. Like people, you know, everyone who listens we to this, like, assumes, yeah, like okay, there are hermaphrodites, but they're not mammals. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So I never thought I would have to say something like, um, "Well, you know, we're not able to change sex just as clownfish can." And I've seen people who are meant to be like serious people, like actual well-known biologists, saying, "Oh, sex is much more complicated than you would have thought." Look at clownfish. Like what? That's like saying breathing is more complicated than you thought. Look at fish. In goes the water. They have gills. I know. I know. What does that mean for me? Nothing. <laughs> and they, know, they must know it doesn't mean anything. So I don't know why they're doing it, except just as a distraction technique, as a sort of a squid squirting the ink into the water to confuse everybody while it gets away. And yeah, so that's depressing. Yeah, it is. It's really <sighs> weird to have to even have these conversations, never mind the fact that they're treated as very controversial. 
Um, I'm curious to know what the response to your book has been. Has there been a lot of backlash? Um, as you probably have experienced yourself, the things that you hear in person and the things that you get from good faith commentary are overwhelmingly positive. Like loads of really, really lovely things, you know, cards, notes, uh, messages on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Not that I look at LinkedIn very often. So if you want to send me a nice message on LinkedIn, I might see it in about six months time. Sorry about that. Um, and, and in person, loads of people have said nice things about the book and the reviews have been very, very positive by and large. And then there's this totally separate thing that goes on over there, which is that people tell the most malicious lies about you. It's just extraordinary. And I try not to look at that because what's the point? But, you know, they quote half sentences from the book that they've clipped so that it looks like you're saying the opposite of what you said. Um, they pick up, you know, single sentences and then say that the whole book is about that. You know, one of the criticisms I got was, uh, you know, why is a cis woman writing a book about trans people? I mean, you've read the book. Like it starts, this is a book about an idea. And then about seven or eight paragraphs it's, in it says, this is not a book about trans people. Like, you know, and I mean, it. as if, you know, like this is an issue. This is actually, I mean, you could write an issue, a book about trans people and that's totally acceptable. I mean, this is an issue that yes. affects more than just trans people. Obviously that's why we're talking about it. Or trans yes, I have never accepted, people, never accepted this idea that if you are not, thing X, you can't write about thing X. I mean, I was a foreign correspondent for goodness sake. I spent nearly four years living in Brazil and I felt I'd every right to write about it. And I would have felt the same about a Brazilian who was living in London and sending dispatches home as some of them did. So yeah, it's, it's bullshit anyway. Of course I have every right to write about trans people if I want, but like when you've literally put in your introduction, the sentence, this is not a book about trans people, to have people criticizing you for writing a book about trans people, extraordinary. Like they haven't read it or there's complete bad faith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me where people can get the book. Is it available in the US or Canada? Right. So I have a copy here. I keep forgetting to do this and I do interviews. So I have to. I would. I don't, have, I, don't, I, I don't have an actual copy, so I can't. Otherwise, oh. I would have done. That. Well, Megan, that may change if you give me an address. Um, yeah, so it's, out, it's been out in England, uh, in, in the UK, since um, July 15th, and it is possible to buy it and has been since since July 15th from Blackwell's, very nice bookshop here that ships globally or pretty much globally free. It takes about three weeks, but it is coming out in the US and Canada on September 9th. Okay, so awesome. Not that long, not that far away. Awesome. Thank you so much for your work. Um, again, thank you so much for doing this interview. I know that it's late there for you. So really I got gotcha, you, Megan. You're one of the people I read when I started to get interested in this. So thank you for doing your thing. Okay. Have a great night. Oh, thanks, darling. Okay. Bye. bye, -bye.